Thanks for joining us. This lesson is for April the 12th, 2020. This is a picture of an ossuary. An ossuary is basically a bone box. For about 100 to 150 years in Judea, in the Bible lands, there was a practice that after the bodies had decomposed, families would assemble the bones and put families together. This particular bone box was found in 1990, and it is believed to hold one of a, the family of the high priests. His name was Joseph Caiaphas, who was the son-in-law of Annas. Now, if you've read the gospel stories and even the first few chapters of Acts, you realize those names are significant. Now, there are people who critique this, but isn't it interesting that we found the bone box of one of the enemies of Jesus and the apostles in the first century? This is a picture of an empty tomb. A tomb with a rolling gate that would close it up. Something similar to the ones mentioned in the Gospels where they put Jesus after his death. Now, I'd like to thank Farrell Jenkins for the use of these two pictures. Farrell is a friend and a brother and an excellent picture taker. Today's lesson is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and that historic fact and what it means for all of humanity. You know, sometimes when we get used to something, I wonder if we appreciate it. And you know, with all of the distress going on recently, Cindy and I have been wondering to each other, and we've discussed it more than once, if we'll learn anything, if we'll come to appreciate what our normal was, if we'll appreciate those blessings more now after the distress and hopefully after the quarantine and the distancing can be ended. Similarly, Christians need to occasionally be reminded of what an empty tomb means. The belief in Jesus as the Messiah, as the one chosen by God, as the one who was a sacrifice so that we could be redeemed. What his death, burial, and resurrection means. As the people of God, we believe in the empty tomb. As God's people, now, this many years away from it, we need to understand what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 when he says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense. Now, 2,000 years ago, what that meant was when people are accusing you of crimes against the state, when people are accusing you of doing evil, be ready to tell them why. In a sense, what it means to us now is to be ready to give an explanation other than, well, that's just what I believe. It is what we believe, and it's what we should believe. But as Christians, we need to give a more reasoned defense. Our belief in the Lord should be more than Princess Leah fighting against the Borg in the matrix for the one ring to rule them all. Those are fanciful stories and a patchwork of fantasy and science fiction. And some folks would believe that the resurrection is just as fanciful, just as science fiction. But as Christians, we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe it to be true, and we believe the Bible speaks of it but not just because the Bible speaks of it. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has many things that point to it in evidence of the resurrection. The external evidence is there was a man named Jesus who was tried and convicted in a mockery of a trial. No one says this is a fantasy. An external evidence says that the Jewish hierarchy then used the Roman occupiers of Palestine to have him crucified. This is not only pointed out in the Bible, in the Scriptures, but this is an accomplished historical fact. 
What else is beyond doubt is that there were eyewitnesses who testified that Jesus was raised from the dead just as he had promised. And those eyewitnesses, as a result, these followers, these Christians, went about proclaiming his death, burial, and resurrection as the centerpiece of a message of salvation. Salvation from the sins, and not just for them, but for everyone in all of humanity. They went everywhere preaching the word, and all of this was a fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures dating back to the beginning. It's important that we understand this because all of this happened in a very short amount of time. This didn't happen a long time ago in a place far, far away. This story, these historical facts began to be accumulated quickly, too quick for it to be just a legend. These eyewitnesses, at one time it is recorded that over 500 of them saw Jesus. They claimed to not only see him, and listened to him, but also ate with him and touched him. He wasn't just some apparition. He wasn't just some vision. But even beyond those who believed in him, there were two notable non-Christians. There are more, but there are two notable ones. Josephus, who was a Jewish military person who fought against the Romans, and who wrote a history of the Jewish people, and Tacitus, a, a Roman historian, and both of them specifically mentioned these eyewitnesses and these believers in the resurrection of Jesus and their faith. Now, Tacitus mentions their faith because some of them faced unimaginable cruelty for their beliefs. Unimaginable cruelty. The cruelty of having themselves being lit on fire because they are Christians to be streetlights in Rome in the mid-7th century. Now what didn't happen is evidence as well. What didn't happen was that Jesus' body was never produced by his critics or his enemies. Never produced. A dead body is hard to get rid of claims that his body was stolen after the means gone to to keep it secure are laughingly short of a reasonable objection to Jesus being raised from the dead. The silence of his enemies and the historical, you know, in all of this, the silence of his enemies. And when you read in the scriptures, his enemies told the apostles to be quiet, but they refused to be quiet. And if they knew where his body is, it would be simple enough to produce it and say, look, here it is. Y'all need to be quiet. And interestingly enough, his tomb never became a shrine. King David, who lived a thousand years before Jesus, Peter mentions his burial place and how it had become a shrine even then. For anyone who's ever gone to the Holy Lands, for anyone who's ever been around Jerusalem and the Holy Lands, if they've ever visited, they know that there are shrines for almost everything there. But yet not for our Lord's tomb, because it was empty. Now there are three possible reasons why the early witnesses became believers, and believers to the degree that they did. One of the things is they could be lying. There are people who lie all the time about all sorts of things. But this seems an unlikely ideal because of what they went through. These first century believers were persecuted physically and emotionally and spiritually for their belief in Christ. Saul, who later became known as Paul the Apostle, faced suffering and persecution and tribulation to such a degree, even before his death. And if he were lying, he would have recanted. But he didn't recant. So it's unlikely he was lying. Another explanation that has been brought about, it says they hallucinated, they dreamed, they saw a vision. He wasn't real, 
But this is also unlikely because so many saw the exact same thing. And they didn't claim that they just saw a vision. The Apostle John said in his epistles that we held him, we felt him, we heard him. The third reason is they really saw it. They really saw the risen Christ. Whatever occurred, there is no question, there is no question at all that something phenomenal happened. And the ripples of that occurrence have reverberated through time with enough strength. It can't be argued the impact of this historic event. And although there's no DNA proof that we can go back and swab and figure out what exactly happened in Judea 2,000 years ago, there is no doubt that it was as notable an occurrence in human history as anything has ever happened in human history. And its effects have shaped Western civilization and in fact worldwide civilization. The foundations of what was core at that time changed completely from that point forward. And it continues to reverberate as many people come to believe. Not just in a religious event, but in a historic event, in a fact. Now there's not only this external evidence. This external evidence means something. But the internal evidence of the Scriptures, the biblical evidence of the resurrection, is clear. Now there are some who would say that they believe in Jesus, but don't believe all that He said. It's important what we believe, and it's important what the Bible says. And one of the things that is said in the Bible, Jesus clearly taught that there was going to be a general resurrection from the dead. Now this was something that divided the Jews. But it is clear in Matthew chapter in Matthew chapters 21 and 22 and 23, when he comes into conflict with the Jews, Jesus clearly taught that there was going to be a general resurrection of the dead. Being raised from the dead was something that became clear. He also taught that it was going to be God's power working through him that would accomplish this resurrection. He says in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 5 and 6, that he was going to be raised from the dead by the power of God. If there's no resurrection, Jesus' teaching on the subject was false. And if what Jesus said about death and dying and resurrection is false, then any who claim to believe in Jesus are wasting their time. On several occasions, Jesus showed that He had power and raised people from the dead. He asserted His power over death. Even in John chapter 11, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he proclaimed his power over death. And yet, in the irony of ironies, instead of hailing him as the Son of Man and the Son of God, those Jewish authorities attempted to not only want to kill Christ, they didn't only want to kill Jesus, they sought to kill Lazarus as evidence of his power. Jesus predicted in the Scriptures that He would be resurrected and said it was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. We have been studying in the Messianic prophecies in Luke chapter 24 and verses 25, 26, and 27. Jesus took time after He was resurrected to teach two of His disciples on the road to Emmaus, to teach them and to explain to them all that the Old Testament prophets said about Him and that it would come to pass. Even Jesus' enemies were aware of this prediction. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 to 66, one of the reasons they set guards at the tomb was because they knew what He said about Himself being resurrected. They knew what He said. An eyewitness testimony substantiates each key fact connected with Jesus' resurrection, that He was actually dead. In both Mark chapter 15 and John chapter 19, in those crucifixion accounts, they knew he was dead. The Romans were good at killing people. Those executioners killed the physical body of Jesus. He was dead and they buried him in a tomb. 
Again, in Mark chapter 15 and Luke chapter 23, they took him to a tomb that wasn't his own, a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 53. Those eyewitness accounts could stand for evidence in a trial. Eyewitness testimony substantiates the fact that he was resurrected from the dead. In all of the gospel accounts, in the book of Acts and in the book of 1 Corinthians, in chapter 15, eyewitnesses saw him raised from the dead. He was, in fact, risen, like he promised, just like he said. The internal evidence of the Scriptures also talks about the preaching of the apostles in the first century. The work that Jesus gave his followers to do was to be a witness. He said in the in the prologue of the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1, he said, you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And what, he, what they were going to testify, what they were going to witness to, was the fact that Jesus was risen from the dead to proclaim his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, what's interesting is during the Gospels, any time he brought this up previously, in fact, Peter was infamous for taking him aside and saying, No, Lord, this isn't going to happen to you. Well, that same Peter, after his resurrection, was the first one to publicly proclaim his death, burial, and resurrection. From the very first, the preaching of the apostles centered on the fact of Jesus' resurrection. It centered on that fact. They didn't run from it. They didn't try to hide it. The preaching of the apostles in the first century was the preaching about Jesus' death. Jesus' burial and His resurrection and according to the fulfillment of Old Testament Scriptures. Both in the Pentecost sermon in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 3, in Acts chapter 5, when Peter went and preached to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, in Paul's first missionary journey in Acts chapters 13 and following, everywhere the apostles went, at every point they spoke of Jesus. And they pointed to not only Jesus' resurrection, but the resurrection of everyone. At the Areopagus in Acts chapter 17, Paul talked about the resurrection. And even though many made fun of him at that point, he stood by it. Even when Christians began to be persecuted, the message did not change. The message did not change because this was the message that our Lord sent them to preach and to teach. Now again, if the apostles thought that the resurrection of Jesus was a hoax, or if they had had the slightest doubt of the actual occurrence, do you think they would have gone through all of this? They would have gone through all of this trouble? As Paul asked rhetorically in the book of 1 Corinthians and in chapter 15, if the resurrection of the dead is false, we are of all people to be pitied. Why? Because we believe a lie. They didn't think it was a lie. They didn't think it was a hallucination. They saw it. Paul himself, years later, saw the Lord. Not in some apparition, but saw Him. Would they have willingly suffered the problems and the issues and the physical torture that they went through, even death, defending something they knew to be a lie? If, there's no rex in, if there is no resurrection, Jesus was a fraud. And the preaching in the lives of the apostles are a fraud. And the preaching in the lives of Christians now are fraudulent and a waste of time. There is enough evidence both in the Scriptures and outside of the Scriptures, to say something happened. But when we consider the resurrection of Jesus, the Christ, if you think the resurrection of Jesus is a hoax, you'd better be sure. There are people today who want to be agnostic and think that that's proof of their elite thinking. I'm not sure. Well, there's no room to be agnostic about Jesus. There's no room for, uh, well, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure if I have enough knowledge. Because, friend, 
If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you think it's a hoax, you'd better be right because if you're wrong, eternity is a long time to be wrong. Eternity is a long time to be wrong about something that makes sense. That there's ample evidence for. So hopefully, since we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead now, we should be faithful to that truth. We should be faithful to the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 2, just about 10 days after Jesus ascended back to the Father, 50 days after Passover, Peter and the rest of the apostles stood up in front of thousands of Jews and proclaimed that Jesus, in His death, burial, and resurrection, was proclaimed to be Christ, was proclaimed to be the anointed, was proclaimed to be the Savior of Israel. He was proclaimed to be that by the mighty works that He did, but even more, that the Old Testament Scriptures pointed to the fact that He was both Lord and Christ and was seated at the right hand of God in heaven. And when over 3,000 of them that day believed, they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And what Peter said to them was, You need to believe. And in believing, you need to repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and for the relationship to begin. And not only was this call to be faithful to the gospel for them, but it was for their children. It was before for as many as God would call. And who does God want to be saved? For God so loves the world that He gave His one and only Son. The call is for everyone. Since we believe Jesus was raised from the dead, we should be faithful and be obedient and trust in the Lord. Since we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, how we live is important. In Romans chapter 6 and many other places throughout the Old Testament, one of the teachings of the apostles is if we believe in Jesus, since we believe in Jesus, and since we have become faithful to Him, there is a definite change in the way that we behave. We don't act like people who don't believe. We act like people who believe. Because... Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection changes everything. Since we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, we have a real hope. A hope that transcends this fragile, earthly existence. I'm afraid, I'm afraid recently we've all faced a pretty tough lesson that the foundation of what we thought we were living on was a lot shakier than we thought. The foundations of our economy and our health have all been rattled by something we can't see. But what has always been true of faith in God, and especially since Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, it changes our perception of everything. Because what happens then is our citizenship is in heaven. Our hope is to be in heaven with the Lord forever. Now it would be wonderful if this existence here would be better. But the way we make it better is by faith. The way that we make it better is by trusting. The way that we make it better is by letting the presence of God have an impact on us. So that we have a real hope and we come to love God we come to love our neighbor. We come to serve each other. And those become the focal points of our life rather than what I can consume, rather than what I can gather, rather than what I get to experience. Since we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, we have the power of God at our disposal. We put all of our trust and our confidence in God's power and the power that causes us to be victorious over sin and death. Death can't touch us in a way that's lasting. There is a sting to sin. There is a sting to temptation. There is a sting to tribulation and persecution. There, is a, there are emotional scars that we learn to deal with. And the, the transparency of the Bible writers about this is phenomenal because they struggled with their human existence. 
But what they really trusted in was the power of God. The power of God that was present at the resurrection of Jesus, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is present in us and gives us a hope, redeems us, and makes us whole like God intended us to be from the beginning. There is solid, credible evidence for believing that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's not some fanciful tale. It's not some science fiction movie. Friends, Jesus doesn't have a bone box like Caiaphas does. The man who was responsible for handing Jesus over to the Romans and for the Romans to crucify Jesus has a bone box. And it's in a museum in Jerusalem. Now the person, the one who is really responsible for Jesus' crucifixion is Jesus himself, is God himself. Because this was the eternal purpose which he accomplished. Now, this bone box is fancy. It shows how rich the people in it were. What we believe is not in a fancy bone box but in an empty tomb. As Christians, we believe in an empty tomb, and we should believe in it wholeheartedly because of the power that it envisions, the power that it offers. We need to live accordingly. We need to believe accordingly. We need to have strength accordingly. Now, just as Jesus suffered in this flesh, we will too. Just as Jesus was troubled, we will too. But what was also present in Jesus' life were not the struggles and the temptations, but the power of God that raised him from the dead. And we can be raised into a life now that is victorious if we believe in the resurrection. Now, if you by chance are listening to this and you have not repented, if you have not confessed, if you have not been baptized in the name of Jesus, understanding all of this, like the Bible says, Contact us. There are telephone numbers and email addresses at our website. And we would be glad to help you in any way toward that end. But it is our prayer that you would come to know and to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, help us to believe. Help us to believe even more that not only are you real, but you have given us evidence. It's not just some belief in some fanciful occasion or some fanciful occurrence. but We believe that Jesus is real. We believe in his resurrection. We believe in your power to change our lives. Help us to believe even more. Help us to confess it. Help us to die to sin. Help us to trust you that you would raise us up, not just from the waters of baptism, but that you would raise us up and make us alive again spiritually. That our sins would be cleansed. And that we would trust you to walk accordingly, to live in newness of life moving forward. Thank you for this amazing opportunity and for this great blessing of redemption and grace and forgiveness because of Jesus. We pray to you because of Jesus and in his name. Amen.